Welcome to the Practical Shooting Video Series. I'm Matt Burkett, and this is Kevin Alpers. We'll be focusing on Kevin as our primary student for the shooting series. We're going to be covering gun safety, equipment, and all of our basics as far as shooting stance and movement. We'll have Brian Enos on the tape focusing on learning how to control your gun and watch the sights. We're going to have Don Golombieski doing a bunch of stuff with his different guns and showing us how to buy a used gun. So now, we're going to go over to uh, the gun safety rules, and we'll be covering those. first rule of gun handling is that the gun is always loaded. So every time you pick up or draw a gun, inspect it safely, control your muzzle, and always treat it as a loaded gun. The second law of gun handling is to never point the gun at something you are not prepared to destroy. The third law, always be sure of your target and what is behind it. Bullets can penetrate a lot of things, many of which will surprise you. Identify your target before firing, even before dry firing at home. If you're not sure what's behind it, then don't fire. The fourth law is to keep your finger off the trigger until your sights are on the target. Almost all the ADs during a match are caused by a finger on the trigger when you're not ready to fire. Two of the other items we need to discuss from a safety standpoint are bad ammunition and your personal protection equipment. Well, we're going to go over the personal protection equipment first. Now, normally when I'm shooting this kind of a competition gun, it's really noisy. So I'm going to double plug using earplugs underneath earmuffs. Now, these are the Dillon electronic earmuffs. So when they go over the earplugs, it's really nice because you can still actually hear, your, hear yourself and hear your friends out on the range, and you can have conversations. As far as any of the safety equipment goes, you want to add in knee pads, elbow pads for any type of stages where you have to go kneeling or prone. That'll save you a lot of wear and tear on your elbows and your knees. Uh, I also wear a different type of shoe for IPSC shooting. I wear a, a spike or a cleat type shoe from uh, football, which the ones I normally use are the Nike Sharks or the Reebok Pit Bulls. You notice he's got a pretty aggressive tread pattern on them. What you want to make sure of on, on cleats is that they have a rounded off back and we'll be showing you in the movement area why that's pretty important. To square back when you put your feet on the ground, your, your whole body will be bouncing around a whole lot. Now we're going to take a set up again for a few different shots on the range and show you what will happen when you get a squib in your gun, which is your other primary problem with ammo. If you have a squib, that is where the bullet gets stuck in the barrel because you didn't have enough powder, you're going to run into a problem where you can actually fire another round behind it and possibly blow your gun up. So we're going to try to show you on tape what it sounds like and see if we can actually fix it. Okay, I'm going to load one round off a normal magazine. And now we've got a squib right after this so you can hear what it sounds like, okay? There's your normal round. Now you heard that little pop noise. That's the sound of the primer being fired and just pushing that bullet into the barrel. Now the case is going to come out and it's going to look nice and empty. The thing about the case is you're going to notice that it's solid black. It didn't seal in the chamber, therefore that's a good hint that it did not push that bullet all the way out the front. Now we're going to go grab a pen and show you how to check for a squib. Now I've went and got myself a squib rod, which is a pen can be used or whatever. What you need is something that's the same overall length as the barrel or a little longer. So when you push it in, you can see if you've actually got a bullet in there. So we're just going to take, put it inside, great, pull it back out and check. And you can see that the bullet's still inside that barrel. So now all you do is just take and put that squib rod in there. And you smack him with a hammer, push that bullet out. We're going to take and try to catch that bullet by locking that slide back. There he went. He dropped right out. And there's the bullet that was stuck in the barrel. That will blow your gun up if you're able to put in a round behind it and fire it. Remember to take the squib rod back out, too.
Now we're going to introduce you to a professional gunsmith, Don Golombieski of Team SVI. He owns a company called Kodiak Precision. Nice to meet you, Don. How are you doing today, Matt? Good. This is an IDPA setup, which you can also use in the IPSC class or the USPSA class of Limited 10. The uh, holster you're running, what, what kind of holster is that? This is a Safariland 560 holster. The unique part of this holster is its, it's adjustability. You can shoot a heavy extended dust cover in it. It is legal for both IDPA and Limited 10. It's easy, easily removable with a paddle. It is very comfortable to wear. Yeah, they call that the custom fit holster, don't they? Yes, it is. Okay. Now, notice you've got this holster on you behind your center line. For the IDPA, all the holsters in gear, including our mag pouches, have to be behind the center line on the body. You can't have it, and that's based off of where the trigger guard's at. So we make sure that that's there. They'll come up and check you on it. The other thing you can't do on any IDPA holster is any modifications to it. So we've got him set up there. Let's see what your mag pouches look like and where they're at. Now you're only allowed to run two mags on the belt in IDPA. So this is a what they call a double mag pouch. What kind is that? That's a Safari Land 073 double mag pouch. Okay, cool. And you can see where it's ran on his body here also. If we get a nice square shot of you, perfect. Okay, now you've got to shoot a lot from concealment. Let's go grab a concealment vest, put that on, and take a look at how everything fits underneath it. Okay, sounds great, man. All right, this here is the vest I use for uh, concealment purposes in the IDPA sport. Now this, I just got it over at a popular uh, supply store. It was about 30 bucks. Any type of vest will do. We did a few modifications to this one that we're gonna show you once Don gets the vest on. Now, any vest you use has to cover up the mag holders and the gun on both sides. You can't have a vest that's sitting there like this exposing the bottom of the gun. Therefore, you wouldn't be concealed. Now, this vest has a major modification in it, which is these panels on the inside. They're stiffeners so that when you actually open the vest up with your hand and draw that gun, it gets it completely out of the way. When you go for your mag pouches, it swivels right out of the way. A lot of the people with the regular standard vests will just take and add weight in the front pocket so when they throw the vest corner, it'll swing out of the way instead. Either way, it's up to you what you want to choose and try out. Uh, these are just sewn in, just some sewn in webbing. It's not a real big deal. So just show us how you'd be standing there normally and uh, just get to the gun. There you go. You can see it's pretty stiff. Okay, great. So we holster, and now we're gonna go talk about some other stuff with Don. Primarily, buying a used gun and setting up a custom gun. Come on, let's go. Let's go. I noticed, Don, that we've got a whole selection of different guns here from Bianchi Cup guns. This is the Bianchi Cup revolver. Correct. And this actually has a base on it. It's, it's a mover base, and it compensates lead for the moving target event at the Bianchi Cup. Calls it. Okay. And what do we have up here? That is a wing for the barricade event. That wing, we utilize the barricade as a holding device for each side of the barricade event. Okay. And now this is your new gun. That you're using the Bianchi Cup. Correct. That's a 38 Super that I built. Uh, that's had about uh, three or four cups under it now, our national championships. It is uh, an aim point sided uh, mover mount that I built also. Okay. And it has an extended mag well. That mag well is custom designed so that I can put my hands together and go prone, have my hands firmly on the ground, but yet have the gun still touching to get a good secure hold because we shoot 50 yards. Okay. And that's obviously lightened up and everything else. You can't order you can't order that from a factory, can you? Well, no, you can't. But okay. uh, that's what custom guns are all about. You, the customer gets what he wants when he orders a custom gun. Okay. Now we're going to take a look at a 38 Super open gun that you built. Right. That's a high cap SV that I built. Uh, the, the compensator is of my own design. It's made out of tool steel. The aim point scope. It has a steel main spring housing in the back to add a little weight, lower in the fulcrum point of your hand. It has a large Stravoit magwell that I've checkered up because that's another gripping surface for me. Um, it has a sprinkle guide rod in it. It's a tungsten guide rod. It helps take a little bit of the the last bit of opening shock out of the pistol and make it return into battery a little quicker. Okay, we're going to go from that to a USPSA 
limited gun and the specific features about the USPSA limited gun that you run into is you'll get first of all your major caliber starts at 40 and you get a long wide dust cover so you want to add more weight to the gun and then you also get a bow barrel versus a standard factory gun to this one what kind of weight difference are we looking at uh, it's about eight ounces isn't yeah it? there is about an eight ounce difference between them and it, it various features you can add you can add a tungsten magwell from a couple places graham's engineering makes a great tungsten magwell uh, yeah bevan has a six and a nine ounce version I right think. Okay. Uh, a six ounce version I really like on a limited gun, but I happen to have that particular setup and I've run it for about three years and, and that's what I go with. So. Okay. Now we're moving over to uh, the factory guns. This was made by the SVI factory. This is our new IMM Open. It has a uh, six port hybrid and a four port regular compensator on the end. Now the compensator on this is just a little different since it's a brand new design. This is a titanium comp that is actually held on with, a th with what they're calling shrink fit technology. There's no threads at all. They take and freeze the barrel, shrink it down, put it inside, let it relax, and you get an actual friction fit between the metal parts that'll never come apart. Now, is, this has a Seymour on it with the new uh, factory mount. It's got the Scott grip, and it's got a steel magwell on it. So you can see that's what the new factory guns look like from SV. They're quite a light, quick handling firearm and they're very low on recoil and muzzle flip. Now it's pretty pointable because we've taken a, a half inch off the slide versus the, the uh, standard style because we're running a different type of compensation system. So it's shorter. We don't have the, the normal weight out on the end of the slide with a uh, standard comp because we're running titanium, which is a lot lighter than the steel parts. Now we're gonna move up to uh, a nine millimeter gun that used to be my gun here. And uh, it's now my students, Kevin's. This is a 9mm gun that can be shot in both limited class in USPSA and in the IDPA enhanced class. Now, in limited, you can only shoot it in minor. Remember we talked about 40 caliber being major. Uh, this would be only shot in minor. That's the minimum caliber available. Now, we've done a few things on this gun. Uh, since it was mine, I customized it myself. First of all, I have Don Golombieski do all my trigger jobs. They're all the factory parts, but he cleans them, tunes them up. This has a undercut trigger guard. I've taken checkered or serrated the undersides of the trigger guard here, and we'll explain that during the draw. We've got a magwell, and it, it's designed to fit fully inside of the competition box. In those sports, you have a box you have to be able to set the gun in with a loaded, or with a loaded magazine inserted, and everything has to fit inside of it, so it's fit for optimum dimensions. Now this one's a little special. It's got an aluminum frame with hardened steel rail inserts, and a uh, shortened top end, so it cycles extremely fast and it's built for 130 power factor ammo. So Don, when you're going to buy a used gun or a new gun from a company, what do you look for as far as the fit, function, and everything else in the gun? Obviously for any type of competition we want a real, real, very reliable firearm. So we're going to look at the reliability issue, how well the gun was assembled, slide to frame fit, barrel fit, and all that's going to lead to the accuracy of the gun. So if you have a loose slide to frame fit, while it might not as be as critical on a limited gun as it would be on an open gun because the scope's mounted to the frame. Barrel fit is extremely important in either instance because no matter how good the barrel is, if it's poorly fit, it's not going to shoot well. Okay, so on this kind of gun, when we've got the scope mount, mounted right to the frame, it makes a lot more, a lot, of, a lot of difference to have that thing centered up and everything returning to the exact same spot. Exactly. Yeah, the slide to frame fit isn't as critical when we've got a limited gun like your SVI single stack with the sights actually on the slide. Right. Um, the barrel lock up here, which generally you can feel by pushing down on the top of the hood, and if a lot of times if the guns fit poorly, you will feel the slide move or you will feel the hood move. Okay. And then there's other checks you can do when you remove the slide from the gun. You can check the head space on the barrel fit within the slide itself. Okay, and that's the, the distance between the back of the hood and the... Uh, and the front so locking lugs. The front locking lugs. And then the other feature, of course, on a bushing style gun or a bull barrel gun is how much movement there is when the gun's locked up in the bushing. Okay. Now, we, I noticed, hand me the gun for a second here. One of the ways that I've been checking slide to frame fits for a long time is taking, putting my hand on the gun, placing my finger right onto the uh, slide and frame area, right in between them, and then trying to twist and pull side to side. And you right. can notice a lot of movement that way normally. Right. Uh, obviously, I can't feel that on your gun. That thing's solid as a rock. 
Now, if you were going to go to a uh, gunsmith and have a gun built, which obviously you're not going to because you are probably the best gunsmith in the country that I've ever had a chance to work with, what would you look for as far as the, the gun and then as far as the gunsmith? Because choosing a gunsmith, I know I've went through a lot of them in my life and everything from delivery time and, and all sorts of issues come up to getting a gun built. That, that just did. There are a lot of issues. Uh, it's a lot of a personal preference. So uh, features you like on a gun. Well, m one gunsmith may, may perform something that you like that's visual, visually attractive on a firearm. Right. Um, maybe he, uh, one gunsmith will do it and the other one won't, but you can, can get a various people to work on the same gun or you can have features incorporated from those various people into a gun. Oh, it's like my guns are factory guns and then any modifications I either do myself, such as the high gripping and, and some of the grip modifications and thinning down the safety. Um, and the, the other stuff that I have done, I bring over to you if I need any minor right. work on it at all. Right. So that works out pretty well. Uh, the, the main thing I was concerned about when I was getting my guns built was what the actual gunsmith delivery time is. Because what I always ran into was, oh, your gun will be done in two weeks. And they don't happen to tell you what year. Well, the <laughs> You're going to find that any good gunsmith has a backlog. Um, generally, I try to get guns in and out somewhere in the six to eight month range, and it, it varies sometimes uh, part delivery on my end. Right. And you may order a gun from me and give me a deposit, and it may take two months for me to get a bar steel barrel just because they're not running that one and they're out of stock, or a slide from Steravoit. It's just the various things. Uh, me, you may have trouble getting an aim point at one time or another. You can run into all kinds of little walls, so to speak. So. So the gunsmith runs into a, a bunch of time frame problems on their end, just getting all the parts. You can. It's like if I built a customer uh, custom rifle, you know, it takes three months to get a stock. It takes two months to get a barrel. So it's the same thing building pistols. Everybody has a little lead time, and nobody can have enough stock at any one time to keep everybody happy. So there's probably about a three-month buffer in there to get parts and stuff together, unless you're stockpiling a lot of parts because you're building a lot of the same guns. Okay. One of the other things I noticed is uh, when when checking a used gun, I bet you I bet you want to look for the safeties on the gun and proper functioning of them. Absolutely. So how would you test out the safeties? I know we've got a uh, we've got a used gun right here that uh, we've got the three types of safeties on this one or two. That's tr no, you actually have three. Okay. You have uh, you have the grip safety. Mm -hmm. And you have the manual safety, and then you actually have both of the safeties work in unison. Oh, really? So, yes, so when you're, go ahead and cock the firearm. Okay. All right, so you have the grip safety on. Right. You can't pull the trigger. Right, you can't move it at all. Okay, now you can knock the grip safety off. And you, and and you can't pull the off. trigger because the grip safety is working. Now depress that, go ahead and pull the trigger. It will fire. Okay. Okay, go ahead and. Now, if this safety isn't fit properly, the thumb safety is what we call it, if that isn't fit properly and this is depressed, it sometimes will uh, take a set on the sear? Actually, what happens is the sear, because it allows movement within the, the safety block on the, on the thumb safeties, do not rest against the sear properly. There's some movement. The hammer hooks are usually about 18 to 20 thousandths on these guns. 18 to 20 thousandths? Thousandths of an inch. So if you, if you start getting movement off the sear, and usually we have a secondary angle on the sear, you start getting into that, then the slightest movement on the safety will allow the gun to fire. Okay. Or when you depress, release the safety with the grip safety you depress, so it will fire the gun. The way to check for that would be to pull the trigger with the safety on, not mash it, just pull it, mm -hmm. then take the safety off and it was failing, the hammer would go down. Right. Which could really cause a problem if you just load it up at a stage. Yeah, and that's where you really want to make sure your half cock notch works on your hammer. Okay, the half cock notch is when you pull the trigger and the hammer will not fall all the way forward. It doesn't go all the way forward. Okay, Correct. so that's a it's a, a safety catch for the hammer. That is a safety catch for the hammer, and it's very important in our game that that works all okay. the time. Yeah, you can feel that half cock notch by just rolling the hammer back a little bit. You'll hear a, a click, and that's where that that notch is at that catches the hammer. Okay, well, I think that just about covers it. Thanks. Hey, Appreciate your time. Hey, you're welcome. Hey, have a good day. You too. What we're going to be working with now is the equipment on the shooter and how to adjust it for your shooting. This is an open rig for the IPSC competition or shot in USPSA, which is the United States Practical Shooting Association. 
This here is an open gun. You can see there's a compensator, a Seymour sight, and we're set up in a ghost holster, which is about the smallest, most compact and fast holster there is on the market. The mag holders are nice. They're up front. We're allowed to run them up here. We're running them at any angle we want to. We don't have to run them in a concealment position or behind the hips like a lot of the other sports. We're going to take these and adjust them out now. So we're going to take this mag holder and we're going to take and twist him so that he's going to lay more naturally to his wrist angle. We See, he's still got it a little high up. we got a little arch right here. We're going to take and lay him down a little bit more. And then we're going to take the edge of this right here and we're going to run that along the edge of the seam of the pants. That gives us a consistent place to put the belt on every time. So let's take this mag holder itself and slide him over and then move him over. Go ahead. Go ahead and grab onto him. See if you can get him unlocked and scoot it over. Okay, grab the other one. Let's move him over. Okay, when you're Okay, when your hand goes onto this mag holder, the one thing you're going to notice is that we want a flat wrist angle here. Notice how he's still got an arch in that wrist. We want to pull that magazine out so it's flat from here to here, and our elbow is in line with the magazine all the way down. The finger is going to come out of that magazine in a nice, straight, relaxed angle. We don't want it flushed down like this. We want it up just a little bit and relaxed, because otherwise, when we put that into the gun, if we've got it like this and it hits the mag well, we can break or damage that finger. So now, he's got it lined up there. Now he's got a spot he can put that mag pouch on every time. Now we're going to set these up all the way around so that arm angle matches the magazine angle all the way around the shooter. So is that one in the wrong angle? That might be, need to be actually moved back a little bit. Okay, that looks good. He, you might actually want to just have this one just a little more vertical, just so we're not okay. bumping into stuff. We've got to take into a consideration range equipment and running into chairs and stuff. That's why on the back of my belt, I don't run any mag holders unless I'm reloading from prone. And that's the only time I'll have one back here. If you're reloading from prone, the easiest way to get to it is to have a mag pouch behind you and actually grab the magazine off it this way. Because it's really hard to get under your stomach at the same time. Okay, now we're going to angle the gun up and put your hand on the gun in the first place. And we're going to try to find a spot where the shoulder doesn't pop up or roll back. So we don't want the shoulder sitting back here like this when we're going to that gun. We've got the option with this kind of holster to angle and rotate it any direction we need. So we want a nice comfortable angle that's sitting there and we want that gun just about vertically. Kevin, why don't you turn this way? Okay. We want to take this gun, we're going to bring him up a little bit. Put your, put your hand on the gun. Okay, we've got to find a medium position between when the shooter is going to be drawing from hands above shoulders and hands aside that just the arms move. The shoulders don't come up, nothing else moves. Okay. Now if you'll notice, turn back this way, Kevin. The, the holster is actually angled in a little bit. Well, there's a little bit too much of a block under here for him. We can adjust that by either taking the block off or by moving the holster forward a little bit, which I think would be a good idea because it looks like he's putting a little pressure on his shoulder getting to that gun. So let's just take and just move this a little forward. Easier said than done. Okay, that's, that's fine. We'll figure it out in a minute. Okay, let's, let's just roll him out just a little bit then. Go ahead and put your hand on that gun. Get a full grip on the gun. Every time you get a grip on the gun in the holster, you want to get yourself a full and complete grip. And that left hand is always matching that right hand in the movement. Okay, thumb up on the safety. Now, we're looking pretty good. We've got a fairly relaxed wrist angle. We're not too far forward like this or back like this. So we can take that gun straight out of that holster. We've got the, uh, let's go hands at sides. We want to come up to the gun, get a grip from the side of the gun. I don't teach the draw coming up from the bottom or down from the top. And the reason for that is coming up from the bottom, you're doing a scooping type draw. That can be a real unsafe thing if, you're not, if you haven't done it a lot of times because you can actually take and throw that gun down range. You, you, if, you, if you don't establish full grip in the holster, it might be a really uncomfortable thing at some point trying to get one on the way out to the target, especially when you're really trying to push yourself. Go ahead and grip that gun up. So we're pretty comfortable there. Now every time he gets a dry grip, which is what I refer to when, the, when we're just standing there doing this, you'll see the top shooter is always standing around just getting a dry grip. 
Every time you do this, that left hand's always coming up and matching. Okay? Now, if you notice when I'm doing it, I don't want my shoulders to lift up. I don't want my head to tilt. My head's not going to be coming down into the, into the gun. When I draw the gun up, the most important thing to do is to keep your body as solid as possible. Okay. Now, you're, you're not getting a full grip on the gun in the holster. We want to grab the whole gun in there. Get a full and complete grip. There you go. Go hands at sides. There you go. All right, what we're going to focus on now is everything from the feet up. We're going to go with our stance, our grip, our posture, how we're working with the gun and getting behind it. So we're going to have Kevin draw his gun out, point it down range here, and we're going to just take an, an easy way to check your stance is to have somebody come up and just put a little bit of pressure on the front of your hands to constant pressure, not just push against you like that, but just put a little bit of pressure on you. You'll notice that he can work as hard as he wants in this position, and he's not going to be able to stop that. So we're going to have to move him and adjust him into a new body position by taking first, checking out his knees, making sure the knees are flexed and bent, then going up to the hips and the shoulders. Now the key on the hips and the shoulders is that the, sh the hips and the shoulders have to remain in alignment. But we're going to just rotate on them a little bit in order to get those shoulders in front of the hips by at least an inch. So we're just going to do this. Now naturally, I slump mostly, uh, most of the time, so I get to cheat on that a little bit. But for the people with really good posture, that, that rotation is really required there. So the easy way to do it when you're at home and checking it out is just rotate the whole thing and then reflex the knees. You're going to want a little more weight on the balls of your feet than the rear of your feet, so you're going to have a positive forward balance, much like a boxing stance or a karate stance. Your stance is so structurally important that your whole technique will fall apart without a really good solid stance. We've got a plate rack behind us here and what will happen is you'll see a lot of people shoot the plate racks and they'll uh, hit the first two or three plates and then start missing all over the place. A lot of people think that's a focus problem or they, they just lost track of the sights. Well, go back into your old stance if you can. When they've shot the first one, second one, third one, now you can see he's off balance. His whole upper body when that gun's going off is going to be oscillating. So that's going to cause real problems and you're not going to be returning the gun to the same spot every time. Now he's nice and solid and that gun's going to be always coming back. With the grip, the primary focus of the grip is going to be the left hand or the, the weak hand for us because we're both right-handed shooters. All of our fingers are going to be underneath the trigger guard except for our index finger. And our left hand, go ahead and put your gun back in your holster for a second. Our left hand is going to be locked into our right hand. The base of the thumb, this little bump down here at the bottom, is going to be locked into the first and second knuckle of the right hand, just like that. So when those come together, we get a full grip and a lock. Now that left arm, since we're running our shoulders square to the target, is going to be straighter than the right arm. That's going to be opposite of everything you've heard about shooting. Everybody runs a strong arm straighter than the weak arm. Well, we don't do that anymore, and the reason behind that is you can't stay square to the target and relaxed and have that strong arm straighter. So we, we just let the right arm just kind of hang a little bit loose, relaxed, and we're pushing forward with both arms. So it's not a push-pull technique. It's a positive push. I'm pushing forward and setting it just like that. If you're feeling the muscles on the upper side of the arm working, that's what we want to have. Go ahead and bring it back up. Now, if you notice, his shoulders came up a bit, so I'm just going to lift up on the gun here, and I'm going to let him relax everything. There, do you see the big difference in his shoulders? Just relax everything, and his left arm is straight on his right arm. His shoulders are relaxed, his head is centered, and he's nice and comfortable. We've got these fingers underneath the trigger guard. What happens with those fingers is if we run this finger forward technique that we've seen some shooters do, and you're a new shooter, you can actually steer the gun in recoil by pulling on that finger. So let's get you up into a good stance and check it out. Great. Now we'll try it on the range.
Kevin, now we're going to be taking a look. We've changed your setup a little bit and moved you over to a limited gun or, or an IDP enhanced gun. You can shoot this gun in both divisions. And we're going to take and set up your grip pressure. Okay, your grip pressure is the most important thing. If you've got too much grip pressure, you're going to over muscle the gun and the sights aren't going to do what you want to do with them. You're not going to be able to shoot fast. So we want to use generally with our offhand or our weak hand more pressure than with our strong hand. Okay. Now, do you know why? No. Well, the main difference is we're working the trigger control with our right hand, and the harder you grip up that right hand, you're going to find that the less trigger control you get because the muscles in the hand aren't going to be working. Okay. So give me this hand here. Now take and, and squeeze, squeeze up as hard as you can, and now try moving that trigger finger. It doesn't move very easily, mm -hmm. does it? Mm -hmm. Now lighten that grip up, kind of like the tension we hold a hammer with. Mm -hmm. We're going to be showing another exercise on how to uh, actually figure out your grip tension on targets. Okay. That will help you out with that. So let's take and draw the gun out. We're going to just do a quick stance and body check. Okay. Nice and solid. Your grip, your fingers are all underneath the trigger guard. That looks good. You're, are you camped forward? You're getting that between that and that knuckle. Okay. Nice and relaxed. The head is upright. And that's the important thing right here. So we're just going to bring up these sights. Now, the whole key to the sights on the limited gun is keeping them squared up in the notch and set right. So you've got that, that front sight is level across the top with the rear sights onto the target. So now, we want a little more tension and pressure with the left arm than with the right. And we're just going to be kind of floating the gun up here. You feel your shoulders coming up? Yep. Okay, relax them. And just just keep a positive forward pressure, and we're breathing through our stomach, staying relaxed. If we can check our tension levels by doing a couple of things. First of all, taking a breath in through the stomach, and then also just doing wiggling our toes. If you can't wiggle your toes, you're really really stressed right before a stage. Okay. Okay. So bring the gun back up. Let's check them. Nice and solid. One of the other things we want to discuss is eye dominance and the relationship with the sights as far as open and limited sights and how that makes, makes differences for us. On, a, um, on our eye dominance, let's take and make a little circle like this. We put it on a small spot out in the distance and we just pull that circle back to our face. Now, which eye are you looking through? My right eye. Well, if you're looking through your right eye and you're right-handed, you're right eye dominant. Okay, if you're looking through your left eye and you're right-handed, your left eye dominant. That'll make a big difference in, in, in your shooting because it can cause a lot of problems if you're left eye dominant. Um, those problems can be worked around pretty easily by just bringing the gun up and all you'd have to do would be to take and move the gun just over to the side like this, that's all. Almost everybody that's left eye dominant and right-handed or left-handed and right eye dominant will actually take and they'll swivel their whole head to get their head to the gun instead of moving the gun to their head. So instead, let's just take and move it just like that. Not a big deal. It's just only a one inch move in the wrist, but it makes a huge difference when it's out on the gun. Now, since you've been shooting for a while, uh, but you've only come into the competition arena, you probably knew that there were other types of stances out there, yes. but not the different types and what they were or why what we're doing now is better. And well, there's the Weaver and the Isosceles. They've got the, what they call the Modified Weaver and the Chapman. Now, I'll show you all, th all these different ones here. The Weaver stance, you're, you're pied off to the target at a 45 degree angle and the left arm's pulling back on the gun, the right arm's pushing forward. So you're more like this, and you'll see a lot of them get down like this. Well, the Chapman's an, an extension of the Weaver where they just take and point straight into them, and they lock that right elbow, and you're still pulling with that left hand. Now, the pulling with the left hand never made sense to me since the gun is actually recoiling, and it's coming back towards the shooter. Why would you want to pull on it and help it out? Mm -hmm. I, that, it, that didn't have any effect on the recoil as far as I can understand. The other problem you run into is with an adrenaline rush, your right arm is stronger than your left arm, and you'll end up pushing that gun down. So you'll see a lot more flinching and a lot more pushing on it. 
The isosceles stance is, is a fine stance. It's, your, your elbows are locked, everything's squared up right in front of you. The problem with it is you run into, you don't use your arms as shock absorbers, and your back and body is so upright and stiff that everything just moves straight around. Now, if you're just standing there shooting one or two rounds, mm -hmm. you're fine. That's not a big deal. But if you're trying to shoot rapid fire and move, that doesn't work that well. So you got the, you got the weaver. Here, here's another limitation of the weaver. When you're, if, you, if you're not allowed to move your feet from the position, you only get a transition to about here and to about here. That's about as far as you can go. With the, um, with the Chapman, it's even more limited to the right, but you get a little more to the left because of the way your arm is positioned. With your isosceles, since everything's locked up, you get, you get pretty good both ways. You get almost 50% both ways. What happens with uh, the stance that I teach uh, is that the arms stay relaxed and you let the arms go to where they need to go. So we're gonna take and we're just gonna rotate around. And you can see I can get almost a full 360 degree pan out of the entire stance. So it does, it, I don't even need to move my feet. I see. And now, tactically, what a lot of people work with is a square range concept. You know, everything, all the targets are always down range and everything's fine. All of the other stances work okay for that. Not great for rapid fire shooting, but for the actual just engaging targets in front of you. But if you've got anything going on behind you, you can't swivel or pivot uh, very effectively to get to it. If you were in a hallway or a stairway or something like that and kind of bound up, you can't get to everything else. The draw, you've got to be able to find a position for the gun that's really safe so you're not drawing and actually sweeping or covering yourself in any way. So I, I try to position my gun so that it's pointing down and it's actually outside of my foot. It's not, if there's a mistake or an accident or anything happens, there's no chance of me actually shooting myself. Uh, that has been an injury that's happened in our sport because people get in a rush and they try to force it and they'll, you know, torch off around early or they'll go back for a reholster, and they'll get, they'll get their finger in the trigger guard and then have a problem or an accident. We don't want that to happen. We want to make sure that you're safe when you're drawing. All right, the draw itself is a very it's a it's a very simple exercise the first thing i'm going to have you do is take and just put your hand on your gun we're going to look and check your angles here and see if everything's positioned correctly i want a full grip on that gun in the holster so your thumb's going to be up on the safety now it's not taking the safety off in the holster the safety doesn't come off until the gun's pointed at the target so we've got a full grip established on the gun so it's nice and safe we're comfortable there now the left hand is going to be in what we call the reception position that's going to be where we clap or where we're comfortable with our hands here. And I'm gonna have that left hand angled out, not like this, to put it into this way. I'm gonna angle it out, and I'll show you why in just a second here. Mm -hmm. So, put it on your, on your hands, there you go, hands aside. Now you notice your hand just rolled off the gun totally naturally and fell to your hand at side position. When you do this, you're getting the gun, you're, get, you're establishing a whole grip on the gun at one time, so it's nice and solid, and you're actually grabbing the gun from the side. There's a couple of other types of draws where they, they come up on the bottom of the gun and scoop it and establish a grip on the way out to the target. I don't like that from a safety standpoint. Of I've actually seen a gun thrown down range because the guy didn't have enough of a grip on it. He got a little excited and all of a sudden he did one of these and he lost control of it. And I'm watching a loaded gun fly down range. So I don't like that from that standpoint, one. And the other standpoint is if I've got to do a draw from surrender, I've actually got to go underneath the gun and then, or then try to establish a grip on the way out. So I'm doing the scooping, sweeping motion. So I'm adding extra movement. We want to minimize our movement on everything as much as possible. So we're here, and we just get a nice dry grip. So we're going to practice some dry grips right now and just, just be moving that left hand in the reception position. 
and we're going to be moving them symmetrically. We want our right hand and our left hand to be moving at the same time to the gun. And the reason for that is if I just move my right hand, you can see my whole body shift with it. I want to be able to make sure I'm balanced the whole time I'm drawing. So it's just right here. Just get some dry grips, some nice comfortable dry grips. Now when we're drawing, we're going to be focused on the target. We're keeping our eyes on the target, the exact spot we want that bullet to go. And just some nice dry grips, nice and comfortable, staying relaxed. We don't want these shoulders coming up, and we don't want our head moving off side to side. Another big thing we don't want to do is be drawing like this, where we're moving our whole body down and compressing during a draw. If we're going to shoot from a stance that's down here or a different type of position, that's the position we should be drawing from, not drawing into that position. Okay, the only time we're going to be adjusting that is when we're actually moving into a position during the draw. Okay. Because then obviously we'll be shifting our entire body to it. So we want to start in our, a way to look at it is start in our shooting position like this, come back, get our dry grip, hands and sides, and then we can just do some dry grips right like there. Okay. Okay, that's a full draw. We're not there yet. So, hands at sides. Dry grip. You can practice these at home for you too. It'll make a lot of sense once you start gripping that gun up. You're going to remember where your hand goes every time and you want to start speeding that up so you're, you're getting a full grip on the gun in the holster. Okay, we've got the dry grip now. So now, in a dry grip, where's your left hand? It's in the reception position, isn't it? Every time. Because we don't want anything else moving. So now we're going to be working that draw out the problem with working it out is we'll end up adding a lot of excess motion, either fishing, which is bringing the gun up and over, it's mm -hmm. also some people refer to it as porpoising, or we're going to be bringing that gun down and scooping, which the gun will come out of the holster and you'll see it's a classic move they'll do this with it. Okay. The worst one you can see is where they actually bring the gun out, down, up, and over to the target. And that's a horrible one. That's, that just adds a lot of time. So we want the most efficient path out to that target, and we want to get on the sights before they're actually, the gun's actually at extension and out on the target. So we're going to start with our gun actually on the target. We're going to work the draw in reverse. Okay. So let's, I'm going to turn on my dot. Since you're on iron sights, we're going to just figure out how to do this. Gun up and out. Now I'm going to be practicing the draw in reverse to find out the most efficient motion to get it back in the holster. And I'm just going to be bringing the gun back about three, four inches and just presenting the sights, whether that's optical sights or whether that's iron sights. So it's here to here, and that's all. Then we practice it another four inches further back, and then we practice it down at the reception position with the left hand in contact with the gun, all the way out, and then we practice it from the holster with the hand established, or with a grip established on the holster. So it's right there. Now if you notice, my head's not moving, my upper body's not moving, nothing. So go ahead and try that in reverse one time, and let's see what it looks like. So the gun's out. Now you notice that the sights might be kind of hard to bring up. So what we're going to do is we're going to figure out how to find these things. If you bring the gun straight down, and if you, if you look at the target, you bring those sights straight up, you'll notice that you've got a vision plane between your eye and the target. And that vision plane, you know what's above it and below it. So what we're going to do is drive that front sight into that vision plane and then push the gun out. Okay. So it's more of a motion like that as an over-exaggeration. So we're going to get that gun up to that sight plane and then push him out. But we're not bringing him up right in front of our face and pushing him out. It's just two, three inches out there is where we're going to try to have the sights up and pushed out to okay. the target. So go ahead, bring him up to the sight plane. Come back. And just be working, establishing the sights on the gun. Okay, bring them back down a little further now and relax. You'll notice you'll build up a lot of tension in your shoulders and your upper body. We want to get rid of that. The whole goal of this draw is that nothing is moving while we're drawing. So we're nice and relaxed. You know, it's just my arms are going to move and I'm going to present that gun. Go ahead, gun up. Okay, your head's moving a little bit, so we want to keep those neck muscles relaxed. We want to keep our shoulders down. We don't. We only want our arms moving. That's it. There you go. Just smooth out that motion. Practice it. 
okay? Now, from this position, break that left hand apart. Now bring it up that way. So it's rolling that left hand in and pointing it up the target. Now that left hand, we've got checkering and serrations underneath the trigger guards on these guns. And the reasoning for that is I use a technique that was referred to as the pinch and roll. And Matt Cartosian actually named that technique. We take this left hand in at an angle like this, and when we, we've got an index spot for that left hand to hit every time, and that's really important because then we know exactly where to go with it when we're bringing it up on the draw. We take and roll it up and lock it out, and we're actually getting a wedge effect from the finger on the trigger guard. So now we get a free bonus lock on our left hand as that gun's coming up. Now you'll notice that I can relax my right hand entirely and the gun even stays there without me doing anything to it at all. Now our thumbs are pointed straight out at the target. Remember our grip, we're just pointed straight out. We don't want these pushing on the gun at all. We can rest them on the gun, but we don't want them pushing on the gun at all. And the reason for that is, if we take and push on that gun at all, we're going to steer that muzzle in recoil. Mm -hmm. The same thing that happens with the finger on the front of the trigger guard. I see. Okay, so let's put it back in the holster and let's do a full draw and see how it works. <clears throat> okay, now your shoulders came up a bit and you tensed up. So let's just relax and breathe. Do a full draw and then I'm going to check your positioning. Pretty solid. Excellent. Now, you notice that it's going to take a little bit for him to figure out exactly where that holster's at, and that's going to be a bit of work. But what we don't want to do is get into the habit of always reholstering the gun by looking at the holster. We want to be able to find that gun all the time by just indexing on it, not having to go, oh, there it is, and put it back in. Okay? So let's just do a couple of draws, Kevin. Now, your sights came in low and then came back up, didn't they? Mm -hmm. That means you didn't hit the front sight into that sight plane and drive it out into the target. You've got okay. to drive that sight into the target. As an, as an over-exaggeration again, bring the gun up in front of our face, none pushing. Okay. Okay. Well, it's just going to be, we're looking for more of a straight line and then a little flattening out at the end of the draw. So go ahead and do so. Are you getting a lock with your left finger in there? No. Why not? You, you're not probably hitting it at enough of an angle then to actually roll that hand up and into that grip. Okay. Okay. There, I saw a pinch on it. You see, you can feel the finger get yes. twisted and you'll actually get a leather pad on the top of your finger after doing this for a while. So, do a couple of nice ones. Let's see what they look like. Now your head came down and to the right, we want to avoid all movement on this draw. If your head does this, you're looking at adding a tenth to a quarter of a second per draw on that, just, just doing this. Because you're actually changing the direction of the target, the height of the target and everything. So you're working in three dimensions, not two dimensions. If, if all we got to do is bring up just the sights and no, move nothing else, it's going to be really easy to get a consistent sight picture every time. If you're moving your head, you're changing the level of the target and those sights, you're not going to know where to put them. So you're going to be, you're going to be looking for them every time they come up. It's looking pretty good. The difference between the optical sights and the limited sights that you have, which are a standard notch and post type sight or standard uh, fixed sights, is that this one is focused on infinity, which means we can leave our eyes focused on the target and pull our eyes back and see the see the dot, or we can leave, you know, or, or it doesn't matter where we're focused at. It doesn't make any difference at all. So they're generally a lot easier to shoot. Um, you also put the uh, dot right on the target and you don't have to do any alignment stuff with the gun. Mm -hmm. They take about the same amount of work though because you still have to hold the gun still. You'll actually see all of your errors in an optical sight. On a limited sight, you've got your, uh, your distance on the sight blade but left and right between the uh, notch, that's extremely important. And then you've got your front sight height, which you want to have lined up and level and dead center with the rear sight.
Now, these can make a, a big, ch you, can, you can shoot these things four or five different ways. When you get out to the range, you can shoot uh, iron sights by focusing on the sights. You can focus on the target, which it, you, probably nobody's ever heard or told you or you've never heard that because they'll almost always tell you to shoot while well, focused on the front sight. That's all we hear in the sport. Mm -hmm. Front sight, front sight, front sight. Right. You know, and it's not totally necessary. What you, what you might want to do is go out to the range and practice shooting at the target with your eyes focused purely on just the front sight, watching it lift out of the notch, which we're going to have Brian Enos talk about some of that. And then you're also going to want to focus entirely on the target and shoot a group that way. And you're probably going to notice that you'll shoot almost the same size group. It'll be just a little less, but you don't have to necessarily stay focused on that front sight, which gives us a lot more options when we're shooting stages on close stuff. Um, the optical sights, they're going to be brought up a little differently than the limited sights. The limited sight, we're going to be bringing that front sight up to the sight plane and then rolling the gun out. We'll be discussing that more during the draw section. On the optical sights, this is a Seymour sight. On a tube sight, you would take and use the top of the tube to bring the scope up. And on the uh, regular Seymour type, you're going to be using these back knobs. So those are the knobs that are going to be coming up into the sight picture. The draw from the concealed position is just a little different than the draw from a standard competition holster. The only thing we're going to be doing is getting our vest or jacket out of the way. So what we're going to be doing here is coming back and using our pinky finger and kind of knife edging the hand so it takes and pushes the jacket out of the way and or flings it out of the way as we're coming from a draw. We get that gun up and drive them out to the target. Unbelievable. The hand been a shot fired over there for 20 minutes. <laughs> Shooter ready. Stand by. <laughs> Gotta let the other mag fall out first. Yeah, but you are re shooting, reloading, and shooting faster than I'm shooting off the draw. <laughs> but this is my job. <laughs> I understand. I'm supposed to be good at it. Shooter. Do I look pretty? Well, pretty as you're gonna get. That's that's what <laughs> I wanted to hear. <laughs> to understand the importance of time in the shooting sports, especially in like Ipsic competition where we divide our points by our time. Is that right? <laughs> points divided by time? Correct. Okay. Found a rock. Just a little one, he's fine. <laughs> All right, get back up. It's tiring, isn't it? Not for someone such a physical specimen as me. <laughs> That'll get cut. <laughs> no, it won't. <laughs> moving. There's only three primary things we do in the in IPSAC, IDPA, and all the other stuff. We're either shooting static, we're shooting on the move, or we're doing something else. <laughs> I saw in your eyes. I <laughs> start out with is learning how to shoot on the move. We do that with a water bottle, believe it or not. <laughs> Can I have a drink? <laughs> I know, I need one too. <laughs> Let me start that over. <laughs> shoot it ready. Stand by. Hold on, what the hell happened to this thing? 